Hey, everybody. Sitting here today talking to Steve, who's created something very interesting. He's built out a pair of our XLS Encores, like the one you see here, out of concrete. And I watched the video that he did on it showing how it was made, and it was really amazing. I can't recommend enough that if you haven't seen it, you got to go play the video and watch what he did and how he made it, because I was really blown away and impressed with the process and the attention to detail and how he put all the inserts in to where it was awesome. So you did a great job on that. All right, Steve, I'm going to ask you some questions in about the build itself. I know you 3D printed all the little parts and pieces. It looked like a lot of different pieces that you had to print off. Just the way everything screwed together, would just I was just so blown away by the attention to detail, You know, especially putting all those inserts in there and printing pieces to hold pieces so that the mold stays centered. And that was just so impressive. And uh, I was surprised, too, at the way you glued the two halves together. And I'm wondering, when you, when you do that, how strong are those adhesives that hold that thing together? Is that something that's that's more like silicone? Is, there, is it flexible in there or does it that's glue hard. more like concrete? It's very hard. There's no way that's coming off. It's not moving. It's it's not coming off. It's you know I did a bunch of research on what would be the best for that. And I'm very, very confident. Now, I haven't done tests where I'm breaking, but I would suspect if I'm going to break that, it's going to break elsewhere, not at the joint. Wow. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that was really impressive the way it went together. And then what was the material that you smeared across the outside, almost like you were putting Bondo over the seam? And I use this Bondo spot putty. So that just fills imperfections after you prime it. You really can see the flaws after you prime it. And then in you know a lot of cases, I can, I can just do that and then paint from there. In this case, I primed it a second time just to, just to get it nice. And I noticed you said you sanded the whole thing down with 150 grit. How much dust comes off of concrete when you start sanding it with a sandpaper like that. So when I'm sanding 150, I'm sanding the primer, not oh, okay. the concrete just, itself. Once you're really I'm not getting it, into the concrete? We're not getting into the concrete anymore. Wow. Now okay. I do take an angle grinder and I'll hit that. Um, like where the seams were? I'll, you, I I'll take you an angle tell. grinder and I'll, I'll hit the edges and clean it all up before priming. Okay. But to get it closer, Right. Some of the seams where the molds meet up, it's called a parting line. Yeah, I could see uh, a few parting lines. Those parting lines, you get, you got to sand that all down. Okay. But once I prime it, I put a pretty good lay, layer, a couple layers of primer on there. So once I'm sanding, I'm only sanding primer now. I'm done with concrete. Wow. So not not really a lot of finish work for the end user to have to make these pieces come together. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. There's a... Decent amount. Now, the texture paint that I'm using, it hides a lot of flaws. So if you were going to go a gloss, I would sand it much finer than 150. Yeah, that stuff sprays on as kind of a texture, doesn't it? It covers a lot. So it kind of looks like stone and it kind of goes with the theme of the concrete. Yeah, it looked really good. I like the way it came out as far as the finish, the look, especially how smooth it looks, just all the curved areas and everything. That's going to really help in the way of the audio playback. When you have a nice rounded edge, even you notice Ron's speaker here, he threw up on the desk, it's got rounded corners, but you've got considerable corner rounding on there. So you don't really have any diffraction at all. I, I'm, I would love to measure one of those. I would bet that the response may be slightly smoother. Uh, I'm going to send you one. Okay. So, yeah, so the, face, the face is convex. Yeah, that's going to so make an improvement in the off-axis response. It should drop off more, more yeah. evenly and smoothly. What type of time frame do you feel like you spend on these? Let's say if the customer prints out the molds, how much time will he spend pouring concrete and putting it together? Like what kind of time factor would you think that a, the if average person you, would have in them? Once you printed the mold, you pour the concrete. It's about a three hour cure time. And then you're demolding. And then I let it dry out because there's still moisture in the concrete. So I'll let it dry out a day or two before I glue them together. And then I'll let that glue together and that's like a 24 to 48 hour cure so there's a lot of waiting time you know it's not like a lot of labor time it's just a lot of waiting time but once you get to that stage then you can go after it and start grinding it priming okay. it so then it's just you know maybe a couple of more days after that and you're you're done that's honestly not a lot more work than building it out of wood then as far as time involved other than letting the concrete cure yeah but i'm the kind of guy i can't build one out of wood i can't i got to do something different I can't build something that everybody else has done. I want to do my own thing. Wow. Well, it definitely turned out really well. And uh, I'm really impressed with how you did all that. Just watching those molds go together was just really impressive. And seeing those 
all those inserts put in where you just got to screw the screws then just straight into those inserts. It looked like everything lined up really well. All that detail work is done in the 3D modeling. So once it prints, I know it's right. all going to go together. Wow. What about if the customer wants to build a pair of these like this? So they contact you then to get the 3D file? What, how does that work? Normally, I put these files on my website and they can download the digital files. In this particular case, I really like this one. I might make some production tooling and make some, make, make a production run, make a small run. That'd be really cool. 3D printed molds, they're good for a few poles. Then they kind of okay. warp and move. And yeah, if you want yeah. to make a bunch of them, that's not the way to do it. You go to what's called a hard tooling or production tooling, uh, which I've got a lot of a lot of experience in. I in past life, I I've done a lot of that. Uh, so that's kind of a, a proprietary method of tooling that I do that uh, for for production. Then I could make you know a hundred of them if I wanted, easy. Wow! And is that basically then you're making a mold that you can use over and over? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, which is more precise actually. Instead of multiple pieces, it's one piece. Because the, wow. the multiple piece thing comes in the printer bed is the limitation. Yeah. So you got like basically 10 inch by 10 inch right. limitation. So in this thing, I had to do, you know, too high. And, you know, right. the back piece was six sections. In a production piece, that right. whole back is one piece. Okay. And the whole front is one piece. goes together. It's much easier, actually. Wow. You never know. I might be contacting you saying, hey, look, I want to do a production run of some of these and concrete let's figure it out we're the same way with stuff like tube connectors we have a big tooling fee to have that stuff injection molded um, yeah there's same with all of those frames that are a high strength polymer so they're injection molded into a into a mold and yeah. uh, that, that woofer frame is a lot stronger than people think and it doesn't ring or resonate like a metal frame will and that frame's strong enough i actually have photos of me jacking up a car and setting it down on that frame and that's the frame that's It'll, impressive. Yeah, it didn't bend or flex or anything. It supported the weight of a car. And I thought, wow, how much weight can this thing have? And and I remember setting the back tires of our Suburban on it, and it held that. And I thought, I wonder if it'll hold it at the front, because the front's even heavier. But we finally reached a point when I put the front tire of the Suburban on it, it finally went, <laughs> you know, it crushed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, never has to, it never has to hold that much strength, obviously. But sure. the fact that it's that strong and that... It's non-resonant. It really helps. Just like the concrete is non-resonant. People don't realize anytime they listen to a speaker, how much coloration is there from the cabinets. And I can put an accelerometer on the cabinet and I can measure how much flex is going on there. And I can see that resonance in almost every speaker. You know, granted, you can brace it. You can add no res in there and you can damp a lot of that out and you can really control it. But a concrete cabinet like that, there's practically nothing there. I mean, so you'd hear exactly what's coming through the diaphragm of the speaker with no coloration. And like I said, people don't realize how much coloration there really is. You know, most of the speakers that we see come in, you see us doing upgrades of stuff all the time. Yeah. And yeah. most of these, you know, three quarter inch, you know, speakers, if they're three quarter inch thick and they're lightly braced, they resonate a lot, like oh, really a lot. Sometimes a lot of the old vintage stuff, it's just a box with no bracing and it's just, it's just flexing like crazy. And you hear that and you don't realize you're hearing it until you take it away. When, when you take it away, you realize it's like, wow, it, it's not there anymore. It's like, that made a big difference. The vocals are cleaner. The bass is, is cleaner. It's tighter. It's more focused. It's a lot of things happen when you take away all that resonances and the, the concrete obviously does that really well. What did you think of the port tube? That was impressive. Yep, I forgot about that. You had 3D printed that and dropped it right in and it fit in perfectly. You can always go in and shorten it a little bit. By shortening it, you can actually increase the bass response just a little and then it'll roll off sharper. It won't go quite as deep. With the with the full length that you've got on there, it's going to extend out there a little flatter and it's going to have a little more of a gradual roll off. So there's so I did the same there. length as your your current yeah. tube for the kit. So yeah. how much should I cut off? You know, you could start with maybe cut off maybe an inch. And oh, that, that much? Might, yeah, because that, that's a really long port. And it, that might tune it a little little higher up to where it's going to give you a little more thump, a little more kick, and then it'll drop off a little little sharper. Well, so, I purposely little, just hot glued it in so it could pop out and I could swap it out for another one. There you go. Try it out. You could 3D print a couple of them and drop them in and out and, uh, yeah. and, and listen to it and see what you think. Yeah. You know, it's going to change per different rooms. If somebody's got them close to a wall 
then it's better to have a longer port because it's tuning it to a point where it's already rolling off. Got but it. If you're more out into the room, you might want a little shorter port and get a little more reinforcement there at the bottom before it drops out because you're going to lose your actual lower bottom end by pulling it way out into the room. You're losing boundary reinforcement. So you probably didn't port. notice on there, but it's three mil wall thickness, and I did a three mil radius on the inside edge. So I, you know, for I fraction. That. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, you did a great job on that. So yeah. I would love to just drop in like this one of Ron's here. Ron listens to these things all the time. I would love to do a comparison and just go from one to the other and just listen and see how much difference. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna make you a, I'm gonna make you one and we'll get it shipped to Texas. <laughs> That'd be great, man. I'll I'll put them on a video and then uh we'll we'll offer them to a customer and I'll send you whatever 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 they uh, whatever you want for them. I'll I'll sell them for you. Okay. After we get to, after we get to listen to them and do comparisons. I'm just super impressed with the way you were able to put all that together. It was more than I expected. You know what's interesting? These egg speakers, these are just the little C notes. They sound pretty dang good in concrete. Yeah. Surprisingly good. Do you have a pretty high-end audio system to hook those up to? No, that's my bottleneck. That's your bottleneck? My bottleneck is my amp. Well, usually it's the room. The room is the factor that determines really how good a high-end speaker sounds. You could put a high-end speaker into an empty room, no treatment, no nothing, and get horrible sound, even if it's the greatest speaker in the world. Okay. But you, but you put it into a treated room, move it out in the room, and suddenly you're creating a, a three-dimensional layered soundstage. Now you're going to really hear differences between, for instance, those encores and those little C notes back there. You're going to start hearing lots of differences because there's more layering aspects in the soundstage and more, more depth and things and more space and size. And as you put it into a room where you're, you've just got them a foot off a wall and you've got a, just a bare wall, most of those aspects are going to go away to a large degree and you're not going to hear those differences. You'll hear more differences in clarity or detail, but not the soundstage aspects that, that the speaker really brings to the table. Right now, these are my computer monitors or computer speakers. Wow. I got a That's wide a nice screen, curved speaker. wide screen. I got one on each side and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. That's a pretty good little computer monitor speaker then. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you located again? In Utah. So you're a pretty good ways away. I'd love for you to come visit and you could hear those in like Ron Soundshed that I'm in now that's completely treated. It's unbelievable. It's like We'll make it, that you, happen. You can hear differences that you wouldn't notice in most rooms. It allows you to hear a lot because you're not hearing room reflections. Interesting. Okay. So cool. something like that, it, there was, there's aspects about that that would really bring the performance up another notch and you would really notice it in some place like the sound shed. That'd be awesome. Well, you just let me know whenever you want to make a trip to Texas. Well, thanks, Danny. Thanks for all your um, help. I, there was a bunch welcome. of things that you helped me with on this that as we were going, I looked at our email thread and it was like in the forties of how many times we've gone back and forth. <laughs> so anyway, it, you, you helped with quite a few little details that, that will improve this for sure. Well, I appreciate it. Okay, Danny, you have a great day. All right, man. Talk to you later.